folks, and thank you to everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate everybody who's been able to uh, get on with us today. First and, and foremost, on behalf of all of us at the Vegas Chamber, and I'm sure all of you, I want to uh, say how grateful we are that the Nevada delegation is safe after the events at, uh, at yesterday at the Capitol. So we were just all on pins and needles watching that, as I'm sure you were as well. So we're just grateful that everybody uh, is safe from the Nevada delegation and others as well. So um, thank you again for joining us today. Today's topic is about uh, uh, economic development opportunities that are going to be available in our state. What is the direction that the state is going with diversification, uh, workforce development? And uh, we're so pleased today and honored to have our, our great uh, panelists with us and my co-moderator, Director Brown. Just have two little bits of housekeeping that I want to get to before we start. We're starting a Legislative 101 series that you're not going to want to miss, uh, and that's to help us all get prepared for the upcoming 2021 legislative session. Uh, the first two of those will be January 12th and January 19th, so you can go to VegasChamber.com to uh, find out more about those. And then we also uh, have Preview Las Vegas coming up on January 21st, so that's on 1-21-21. It'll be a virtual uh, event this year with a lot of surprises, so we definitely want to encourage you to, to sign up for uh, Preview Las Vegas. Also want to thank our sponsors today, the UNLV Executive MBA Program and SCE Federal Credit Union. We could not do these series of webinars without great sponsors like them. So thank you again to our sponsors. Uh, today we're bringing you the best and the brightest minds in economic development. And so, uh, I, as I said before, and they're all in one Zoom, one all in one Zoom room. So we're thrilled to be able to do that. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty this morning. So we have Mr. Mike Kazmierski who's on the phone. Hopefully we can connect with him. Uh, I'd also like to introduce my co-moderator uh, this morning, uh, Mr. Michael Brown. He's the director of the Governor's Office of Economic Development. Thank you so much, Director Brown. As I mentioned a second ago, we have Mike Kazmierski. He's the president and CEO of EDON, the Economic Development Authority of Western Nevada in Reno. We also have Mr. Jonas Peterson with us. He's the CEO of the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. And then our extra special guest again today is Dr. Roland Steven. He's the director at the Center for Innovation for Strategy and Policy, uh, SRI International. So thank you gentlemen for joining us today. We really appreciate you all being with us. I uh, can't tell you how much we appreciate that. Um, I'll start with my co-moderator today, Director Brown for some, for some opening remarks and then we'll uh, go to the rest of our guests. Doc, uh, Director Brown. Thank you, thank you, Mary Beth, uh, for inviting me and for organizing this event. You and the Chamber have been stalwart uh, partners since the start of the pandemic uh, and it, when it gripped Nevada at the end of February. Professional emergency responders, people who deal with hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, they do floods. They divide things into a phase of, of response, relief, and recovery. Um, a pandemic differs in that because we are still today, 10 months into it, still dealing with response issues. Um, it, 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 and it's simultaneously rolling out relief programs while trying to plan recovery. In June, it, it appeared that maybe we were coming out of the worst only to have a second wave hit with, ferocity, with a ferocity more intense than the first. On Wednesday, just this Wednesday, we had a record 61 COVID related deaths. That's 61 Nevadans today that are having to deal with funeral arrangements and the tragedy of losing a family member. And it brought us well over uh, 3,000 in deaths in Nevada with over, over a quarter million Nevadans uh, have had to deal with a COVID report uh, illness in the, in the last 10 months. So the response continues. However, we were, Governor Sisolak's leadership launched relief measures in, January, in, in July. Now the federal government had launched relief measures uh, in April. We were one of the first states uh, to qualify for uh, disaster relief loans. And I learned yesterday that on a per capita basis, we're one of the top 5% of states for utilization of PPP, which uh, the Small Business Business Administration uh, credits the great work of the chambers of communicating the message and the terrific support we got from the Nevada Bankers Association and the Nevada Credit Union Association. I belong to a network of, of uh, state economic development directors and in every consultation that I've had with them for the last 10 months, I've always felt that Nevada is ahead of the curve when it comes to response and relief. 
Um, the governor allocated close to $100 million for externally facing uh, relief measures that included $40 million from CARES Act resources for housing. It included initially $20 million and then rose to $51 million uh, for small business assistance, plus $10 million for commercial landlord assistance. With the great leadership of Zach Conine, the state treasurer, we've rolled out that and nearly, I think, 90% of that money is deployed. And obviously, we hope that we'll see more federal resources so we can continue to fund, uh, fund those kinds of needs. That's a substantial investment in Nevada small businesses, uh, probably record. Uh, we're researching that now. In the process, Treasurer Conine and I spoke to hundreds of small businesses over the last few weeks and, and understand the challenges that they face. And we're trying to do all that we can. The government is good. Government is good when it comes to helping uh, stabilize the financial system, but it struggles when it comes to stabilizing the neighborhood coffee shop. Uh, I believe that some of the programs we've been in to put into place have, have helped address that need. Uh, obviously, we also need to be looking forward. And so the state contracted with SRI, uh, which, which has its roots at the Stanford Research Institute, early in the pandemic. And Dr. Roland Stevens has provided ongoing advice and consultation to us. And he'll give you a preview for Preview Las Vegas of what we see going forward. Obviously, we need to put Nevadans back to work. Uh, on our tourism-based economy, that means we have to have a secure public health system. Um, you know, you want to see recovery uh, accelerate? Wear a mask practice social distancing. And ultimately, in a state which has low vaccination rates for many infectious diseases, we need to have a firm commitment in the business community to securing vaccination, because only then will tourists return uh, to Nevada, and only then will business and conventioneers follow them. And so uh, I look forward to uh, working with all of you, and, and I'm pleased to be partnered with Mike Kazmierski and Jonas. I had the distinction of serving on both of their boards in my private prior private sector life and enjoy working with them today. I won't steal Dr. Roland uh, Stevens uh, thunder as he rolls out some of the ideas that we'll be bringing forward uh, for recovery and resiliency. And thank you for inviting me to join uh, you this morning. Well, thank you so much, Director Brown. We appreciate your remarks and your service to the state. And on that note, uh, regarding the state, we're not just focusing on one particular part of the state. Certainly we all work together to make the great state of Nevada. So on that note, that's why we invited uh, Mike Kazmersky from EDON in Reno. He's with the, uh, the CEO of the Economic Development Authority of Western Nevada. So Mike, let's go to you for just a, a few opening remarks and then we'll go to Jonas. Well, thank you, Mary Beth. First, I wanna make sure you can hear me. We can, thank you so much. Okay, well, that's good news because our entire building went down this morning about five minutes before we started to do our video check. So I apologize for that. Uh, glad we can connect via phone. Um, first off, uh, it's a very different world up here than it is down south and in many other communities. Really, uh, a priority towards safety and response to the pandemic has been um, important, but what this pandemic has demonstrated is the value of diversity. And I'm talking about economic diversity. We've been, I've been here a little over nine years, got here at the end of the 2011 recession, and Unlike Vegas, Reno Parks area realized that our tourism and gaming economy would never recover to the level it once was. So we got uh, well coordinated as a community and addressed diversification. And in that process, um, aggressively sought to attract advanced manufacturing, data centers, um, work to grow our entrepreneurial ecosystem, and really took advantage of our logistics e-commerce potential as a logistics hub and all those areas um, you can imagine are weathering the storm quite nicely because everyone in those operations are at work. They're at work, they're dealing with the pandemic, with the social distancing, the companies have made adjustments, but our manufacturing is, is, is humming, our data centers clearly are operational, our entrepreneurial energy uh, like the technology workforce can do a lot of what they need to do from home and the logistics and e-commerce obviously is exploding because of all the orders of, of everyone trying to get their items to be delivered. So what that means is our workers, employees are, are working, 
Our sales tax revenue, if you can believe this, is 8% higher this year than it was last year. Uh, very important for our local governments. Our household income over the last seven years is up 45%, and that's part of that diversification. You're bringing in advanced manufacturing jobs that are paying $25 to $30 an hour, technology jobs that are paying you know, $40 to $50, $100 an hour, and, and that has helped us there. Our unemployment, 5.4% versus the national average. We're almost a point below the national average. And our gaming revenue, if you can believe this, is actually uh, up year over year. So diversification works. It's something that we have been fortunate to have put a lot of work into over the last nine years, and it's starting to pay dividends at this time. All right, great. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, I know you've done a lot for diversification in Northern Nevada. Uh, and now let's go to Jonas Peterson, the CEO of LVGEA, uh, to talk about Southern Nevada. Yeah, hey, uh, Mary Beth, Vegas Chamber, everybody on. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to join this important and, uh, and very timely discussion. Uh, so uh, some things I want to share. First, uh, there's no doubt 2020 was a catastrophic year for our economy, especially in Southern Nevada. In April, uh, we'd lost over 280,000 jobs. Our unemployment rate was, you know, around 30 uh, percent. So, you know, so a tough uh, point in time. And by the way, over 240,000 of those jobs lost out of 280,000 were lost in Clark County. So think about that uh, for a second. Absolutely uh, devastating uh, period of, of, jo of job losses. Now, the good news is we've started to bounce back. I'm optimistic about 2021. In fact, I think there's reason for all of us to be, uh, to be optimistic. Here's why. Uh, our economy was structurally sound prior to the pandemic. We didn't have any glaring bubbles like before um, uh, before the Great Recession. There's no economic reason why we can't recover fairly quickly. Those those economic difficulties that are still with us, they're, you know, they're related to COVID-19, to uh, to the the shutdowns, and a vaccine is on the way. We've seen those plans, in fact, already being rolled out. So as we get into the middle, the end of uh, 2021, I think you will see great improvement in our economic condition, jobs returning, tourism starting to uh, to bounce back and really capitalize on some pent up demand that's out for tourism. Now, in, in Southern Nevada, the, the damage has been great and our recovery has been slower than other areas of the state. We're seeing improvements. Um, Companies that put decision making on hold are now starting to move forward in the, the relocation process again. That's very, uh, very encouraging. Here's one really impo important point I want to share with, uh, with the audience. Nevada has a difficult legislative session coming up. Uh, one of the big questions, at least from my point of view, is um, um, is one of the big issues is going to be maintaining state level investment in economic development. Last year was tough to say the least, but our economic development system has been working. Um, you know, working back after since the, the Great Recession. You've heard some of that on the call. Um, we need to continue pushing on that effort. Um, in fact, now more than ever. So the, the question is, can we, can we as a state continue to maintain the investment in economic development at that time when, when job creation is really needed the most? There's so much good work we can do. 2021 is going to be a big year for the states and the regions across the U.S., those that have the resources to be aggressive. I hope we can um, uh, maintain the resources we need to be successful. So if you're on this call, I would encourage you to reach out to, uh, to the legislator, share the importance of job creation, especially in Southern Nevada, especially right now. Um, I'm optimistic about the upcoming year. In fact, um, we've got some, uh, some good announcements to share, and we'll be uh, rolling out some more of that at our State of Economic Development event on February 9th. I'll cut it off uh, there and throw it back to you, Mary Beth. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Jonas. We'll be sure to mark down February 9th on our calendars. And, and thank you to you, uh, Director Brown and Mike Kesmerski, because you've set the stage perfectly for Dr. Roland Stephen. Uh, you know, you've given us the, the, the strengths and the weaknesses, some of the challenges. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Stephen has a, an excellent PowerPoint on Nevada's plan for recovery and resilience. So Dr. Stephen, with that, uh, thank you for being with us and I'll hand it over to you. Uh, Mary Beth, thank you very much. Uh, and I, uh, colleagues on the panel who I, I know well now over the years, uh, this is a privilege. Of course, it's also an opportunity as we look into 2021. Uh, I think the second half of the year is going to look very different to the first half of the year. And I, I quite agree about that. Uh, and I think uh, the medium term is very exciting for uh, the state, uh, both North and South. Uh, so I'm going to move quickly through some slides. I promise uh, there will not be death by PowerPoint. I can. I like talking quickly. I've got uh, my 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 pronunciation is crisp, so I hope you get it all. And uh, it's the back end of the presentation that's most important. So uh, Director Brown and GoEd and their allies in state government and of course in the regions of the state, including rural Nevada, have done tremendous work on immediate recovery activities getting federal resources to small business, getting PPEP out there. And they've had many, by the way, private sector allies in that, a model of a private sector engagement. So the back end of my slides are gonna be, I think the more important part, and I've always felt it's our job at SRI to look down the pike a little bit and to see uh, how to make the most of what could be an exciting period in the US economy generally. <clears throat> However, uh, let's start with the slideshow, and we'll start. We'll start with the. Uh, we'll start with our vegetables. We'll take a look at uh, an economic forecast that's part of our uh, plan uh, provided kindly by RCG Economics. I know is a good friend to you all there in Southern Nevada, uh, and they contributed this to the uh, uh, to our uh, to our reports. So I'm going to click through very quickly uh, as. Uh, Mike mentioned SRI International based in uh, Silicon Valley, formerly uh, a unit of Stanford University, an advanced research institute. My shop in Washington, DC does technology and uh, based and uh, skill-based economic development as well as uh, program assessment and evaluation. Let's quickly turn to the public health, the, today's reality, public health and economic challenge. The pandemics hit everyone, as you just heard from Jonas, Southern Nevada is particularly exposed with a pro-cyclical economy. That job number Jonas mentioned, that is almost equivalent to all the jobs created in the recovery from trough to peak after the last downturn. So in April last year, state of Nevada practically gave back everything. Now, a lot of that was temporary. Some people are getting back to work and so on, but still the, the, you can imagine the scale of that shock. Here uh, we look at some scenarios. Once again, let me uh, recognize John Restrepo there who helped us put, who put this together. Uh, looking at the end of 2021, uh, most likely case he still thinks uh, that he and his team uh, still think that uh, uh, Nevada's economy will be between four and 5% below what it could have been in a no pandemic scenario, okay? And uh, of course, uh, as you've just heard from Mike Kazmierski, a lot of that implicates Southern Nevada, right? Southern Nevada's unique exposure. Uh, what to do about that? The immediate recovery just referenced Michael uh, and uh, Director Michael Brown and the GoEd team and all of their partners and allies across the state have been addressing the coordination problems, the information problems, mobilizing data, mobilizing leadership, uh, and so on uh, to accelerate recovery. I'm gonna speak a little bit to that. And then working with stakeholders, what are the visionary policies, right? That will set Nevada apart from the, for the future. That really is uh, where I have done a lot of thinking. I think that's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, and particularly when we turn to Southern Nevada, if, and uh, it's true, Northern Nevada was at a fork in the road at the end of the Great Recession, 2010, 2011. Southern Nevada is at that fork in the road today. 
of course, Vegas will be back, right? Of course, uh, Southern Nevada's incredibly incredible world competitive advantage and world brand for that matter in hospitality, gaming, entertainment will, con will flourish again. But the future for the region has to be more than that, right? Because let me tell you, crises are kind of like buses. Sooner or later, another one will come, come by. And, and does Southern Nevada uh, still want to be hooked up to this pro-cyclical economy, this economy which is great in the boom times and then is, it really takes it on the chin in, in, the, in the bad times. Um, so with that in mind, let's, uh, let me turn to a little more on the background. Uh, these, look at this, it's that number. Nevada added 285 jobs. This is actually old data between 2011, that's the trough, and uh, uh, December 2017. They added more after that. Boy, Southern Nevada was an exciting place to be last February, right? Before you know, the, 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 the vehicle went off the road. Uh, many of those jobs now, of course, have been under stress, even if temporarily. Here is a, uh, something from a report we presented for, uh, we, an assessment we did for uh, the governor's office. Uh, and it, it is not a map of levels of unemployment. It's a map of the rate of growth in new jobs following the last recession across Nevada. And we see while gaming and tourism, right? A lot of jobs didn't grow that quickly. Also, by the way, the color coding indicates the pay, average pay levels in those jobs. Aerospace and defense, almost 20% over that period. Natural resource technologies, uh, 20, uh, 26%. Health and medical services. And I don't have to say this to anyone listening to this presentation. Health services and medical services uh, and Allied health services are a huge task still before leaders in Southern Nevada. Manufacturing and logistics, 27%. A lot of that in Northern Nevada, plenty of opportunities of that in the future, I believe, in Southern Nevada, right? And of course, wages much better than other parts of the service sector. We did a SWOT analysis. You know the strengths of your state well. You know also some of the challenges, right? It's a, it's a dynamic state. Michael and I often have this conversation, but you know, people in Southern Nevada, they, they've got a job, they've got a side hustle, they're ready to start new businesses. They're not here uh, because they're looking to uh, escape from life. They're here because they wanna work hard and do a little bit better than wherever they came from, right? It's so often the case. So that, by the way, is a tremendous natural resource. In the 21st century, that kind of enterprising population is what I prefer to have that almost than anything else. Uh, you've got a small state advantage. Someone wants to get something done. They call Jonas. Jonas has some challenges. He knows the five people in Nevada to go and call and get it done, right? That's not true in California, let me tell you. Uh, and you've got some established models of success in workforce and education. You also have some challenges, candidly, in education, more broadly. Uh, and a lot of your opportunities as a, as a location Southern Nevada in particular, we'll have a little picture about that in a moment, beautifully located between, right near the West Coast markets, near Phoenix, Arizona, right? The way to make most of a great location, as any realtor will tell you, is to have nice structures on it, right? Nice infrastructure. So that's uh, the opportunity for the future. That's something that needs to be fixed up. Access, so there are your opportunities, access to West Coast markets, uh, Las Vegas world brand. It's a great brand. And wh whether you want to broaden it, uh, whether it's everything you want it to be, there are very few metro areas in the United States or indeed anywhere in the world that have the kind of brand that you all have. Figure out how to trade on that, right? There's some opportunities for mining diversification. That's happening. Be a test bed for new technologies. Be a place for people from the West Coast to live, work, and play. I've thought about this personally in, 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 from the point of our own office. And it's now clear to me, no one is going back five days a week to the office. Certainly not if they live in 
you know, $2,000 a month studio apartment next to the 101 freeway in the Bay Area, right? They'll go and live somewhere else and they'll come to the office occasionally. Where is that somewhere else? Nevada is that somewhere else, potentially. Actually, it is in Northern Nevada already. The real estate market is booming. And I think you've seen some of that. It's been quite sustained in the South as well. Here's a map provided by uh, a, a good friend of Southern Nevada, as you know, Rob Lang and his colleague. Uh, and it's this picture of the megapolitan clusters, right? So Southern Nevada is intrinsically tied into Southern California and Phoenix, right? Which is a, which is a major metro labor shed, right? There are workers who could travel workers and, and, and uh, distribution networks and other, and, and other kinds of things can occur very easily within that pink area. The north likewise looks northwards, looks towards the Bay Area, and indeed eastern Nevada, right, tied into the uh, Wasatch Range and even, you know, to the Front Range in terms of its relationship to the Mountain West. So Nevada, you know, is location, location, location. Nevada's got a great location. Do you have the infrastructure and the other kinds of assets that tie together these, these three mega regions and indeed serve to knit the three mega regions together. Action strategies capable is gonna move quickly for the next few slides. Get resources for people in business. Michael has been waking up every single day, working with the treasurer, working with others to make sure that federal dollars come down quickly and, and federal resources are applied quickly. Likewise, provide guidance. Jonas and, and the, uh, uh, the Vegas Chamber, I thought the Vegas came out with, with guidance on PPE for small businesses. The best guidance I saw, the quickest. Very, very impressed by that. That's the kind of thing had to be done right away. Get people into new jobs. Some of the jobs that have gone are not coming back. So get people into new jobs. Uh, Allied Health Service, Health Services obviously mentioned that. New technologies for business, right? It's amazing, even, you know, people, businesses in the Washington DC metro area struggled with mobile payments, online, online offerings, managing their workforce in a remote way or a partially remote way. These, these necessities technologically are not gonna go away, they're with us forever. And, and data for decision-making, I'm gonna move on quickly. But uh, GoEd has provided through Garrett Cares Act funding an incomparable resource for labor market intelligence called MC. Jonas has access to it. Mike Kazmierski has access to it. Michael has access to it. It is state of the art in solving the matching problem between people and jobs, simply stated. And if we're in a period of change, and we are, uh, it's all the more important to have this kind of real-time intelligence. Before I go into the visionary strategies, I just want to say something, and I'm keying off here something I heard actually from Chris Sanchez. I don't know if he's on this call. Um, he might well be, right? Um, <clears throat> we know that a wonderful biotech science sector in, on planet Earth produced a vaccine in less than 10 months. It didn't just produce it. They made sure it was safe, and they brought it to market. That is 10x faster than it ever achieved something like that. That's an extraordinary human achievement. We are beginning to see data, however, that businesses are moving and adopting new technologies 10 times their regular speed. That online shopping has gone up many times, right, in a matter of weeks and months than its growth in preceding years. So the rate of technological change in the, in the years ahead, I fervently hope, will be extraordinary. This implies, of course, change in work, change in kind of work, the kind of work, change in new opportunities for new work, right? Uh, and uh, uh, quite radical potential for growth. How does Nevada play into that? That's really the subject of our visionary strategies. Be an advanced manufacturing hub. There are compelling supply chain and, to be perfectly candid, uh, national security 
considerations around onshoring some manufacturing. We're not going to buy some of our critical biomedical or uh, electronic or other kinds of ingredients for an industrial economy from just anywhere. That's not gonna happen in the future. There is an opportunity already, let's say there is, the opportunity, I'm, I'm sure Mike has got three guys in his hip pocket to be arriving tomorrow, right? There are opportunities for onshoring in that space. And around that, of course, you will need logistics. That means world-class communication technologies. That means world-class transportation and multimodal facilities, right? That means all of the hardware that goes with it. Secondly, a world-class carbon economy. Uh, Nevada should be home, is home already to the renewable energy supply chain. Batteries, yes, but maybe other things. Geothermal technologies are a first cousin to fracking technologies, as you may or may not know, right? You could provide a lot of, you will be providing a lot of uh, Nevada's needs for renewables, not just from solar, although solar is highly competitive, but from geothermal in the years ahead. Guess what you need though? Infrastructure. You need to have the grid that can balance out those uh, uh, sources of power. Uh, and then uh, be a place to experiment. The, um, we know that Las Vegas is already a place for the Boring Company. It's for the Virgin Hyperloop. You've got autonomous taxis. That's great. And you know, I'm agnostic. If some of those autonomous taxis crash into someone, go and experiment with a different technology. Uh, be a place where <clears throat> innovators and innovative businesses can come and bring their wares. Some people, almost no one knows this, but it's one of my favorite anecdotes. The very first public demonstration of a steam train ran over a cabinet minister in the British government. Now in the present day, that would create cries of alarm and all kinds of, oh, well, we can't do steam trains. They run over people. That is in fact not what happened. The whole country was covered with a network of railways within a matter of a few decades and growth and productivity went with it. So we, we, need to, we, need to, we need to have that kind of attitude, right? Technology, total connectedness. I'm agnostic. Will it come from satellites? Will it come from glass in the ground? Maybe it's both of it, you know, all of the above, but that is, that's like water and power, simply stated. Schools have got to be included, hospitals got to be included and so on. Data hubs and data services, digital public services. People shouldn't have to go into an office and fill out a form to interact with their governments. They should be able to do it on their mobile device. It's that simple, right? Be that kind of, be that kind of uh, government. And finally, be a remote work playground. Quality housing, you have it at a good price. You really have it compared to Southern California. Foster outdoor recreation. Nevada is an outdoor marvel. I think uh, probably undersold. Foster arts and entertainment, you have, by the way, in Southern Nevada in particular, a brilliant population of artists and performers, right? They, they can do much more than just wait for the resorts to open. Give them the opportunities, perhaps digital, perhaps otherwise, right, to flourish. Oh. Capabilities to realize the vision, to realize some of these things, you will need underlying change in some of your ways of working. Fully fund the state infrastructure bank. It was authorized, I think, 20, uh, 2017. I know that the treasurer is working on that. Established sovereign wealth fund, not gonna talk much about that now, but there's plenty of opportunity there. They're, they're in the report, you'll see many states have them. They are helpful for strategic long-term investments. Build local networks of innovation and evergreen funds. Have, uh, have a innovation fund working through business with your research institutions. Have one door for one door to knock on in, in state government for small and medium sized business. Grow community banking networks. See, there's quite a lot on finance here. You'll see uh, that, 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 that it's thin in terms of the infrastructure in Nevada. States with deep networks of community banks, uh, other kinds of banks did much better 
in weathering the storm for small business. So, uh, and then there's some governance and funding mechanisms for the community college system in the future. That is the future, right? Those are the institutions that are going to fuel your transition to advanced manufacturing uh, and to other, other kinds and to health services, for example, allied health services, and follow the statewide climate plan. The, guy, the, the candidate enterprises that you want to touch down in Nevada have 100% renewable energy as a condition for doing business, and very often is the case. So that's all I've got right now. Thank you. I went longer. Mary, Mary Beth, I apologize. No problem, Dr. Stephen. Thank you so much for that great uh, presentation. I, I know that set up set the stage for a lot of questions that we have in the chat, and I do want to encourage everyone to ask your questions. Uh, and with that, Mike Kazmierski, there is a question in the chat regarding publicly traded startups uh, in neighboring states and, and they're relocating uh, and so forth. Um, this person asks, it's William Leppard. I, I know, Mike, that at EDON, you're focused on the importance of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial development and now we see you, excellent. Hi there, Mike. Uh, you're focused on the importance of entrepreneurial development. What are you and what is the state doing to foster the startup growth uh, and what sectors present an opportunity for startup growth in Nevada? Well, that would be enough for about a, a one day uh, session, but let me keep it really short and sweet. Entrepreneurship is such an opportunity for the state. We seized on entrepreneurial growth as something that we thought was important for our, our diversification efforts and really put a lot of energy into it. In fact, our entrepreneurial team is as big as our, our attraction team here at Edon, three people, because we believe it's so important and it really talks to organic growth, the ability to get ideas that are in the region, connect to the university system and the innovation that is, that is coming out of the university system, keep those entrepreneurs in the area and then help them on the path to success. It's, it's not rocket science, but it is hard work. And we built, it, built an ecosystem here that has been very successful. We've got many startups now. In fact, we launched a, a, a Reno seed fund out of Edom that has invested over a million dollars in at very, you're talking small levels of investment, 500, you know, 50,000 to 150,000 dollars, and yet that million dollars we put into the entrepreneurs has has produced results that a follow-on investments of 10 times that into our region and created and attracted many technology workers and innovation to the region. So it is an opportunity for this state. A lot of those workers are fleeing California. We have a great environment, quality of life as Roland talked about and all the other things, we believe we can attract some entrepreneurs, ideas from other states, but not only that, grow the organic ideas here so that the companies are here. We don't have to drag them out of another state. We can just grow them here. So that the vision for the state to be the, the most entrepreneurially friendly state in the nation would be a great vision because it would allow us to really embrace that kind of idea. And I think we've got so much going on here from blockchain technology, and you saw a digital currency going off the chart today. Um, you've got battery technology, which is state-of-the-art, unbelievable opportunities there, uh, the lithium uh, connections and other things that are just organic to the state already, and we're already taking off on it, electric car technology. Roland talked about some of the technologies that are going on in Vegas. We are an innovative state, and if we could harness that, it could drive us to the next level as far as economic development. That's an excellent point. Thank you so much, Mike. And I know we could have several webinars just on that. Uh, Director Brown, I wanted to defer to you in case you had comments or, or any uh, questions or points to make. Yeah, we are in, we're in discussion with a couple tech companies right now. Um, Mike and, um, and J Jonas have got uh, others that have been knocking on the door. You know, a lot of companies, they're, they're waiting to see, they're uh, on hold, waiting to see what the pandemic is, but they're, they're kicking the tires. I think one of the things that has happened is I get a lot of calls from people who have second homes in Las Vegas and they've, or, in, or in Lake Tahoe and they've taken refuge here and they're calling us about with their ideas on what they can do in, in the 
state as they're living here now. They're getting more familiar with the state. And I've got one company that's talking to us about trying to bring, bring their business here. And frankly, absent the pandemic, uh, I think they would have stayed in California. But living at Lake Tahoe now, they're very intrigued with, with coming here. So uh, we're going through that, that process of evaluation and socialization. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Director Brown. Uh, Shondell Newsom um, is on and he, he made a point just a second ago, small businesses can be a major part of the recovery for Nevada. How is the state ensuring that procurement opportunities stay within our state until we are healthy? And are we able to restrict procurement contracts going out of the state until we have our economy back? That's a good question, Shondell. Anybody like I can speak to that if you, uh, the, the Secretary of State, Barbara Sagaski, who serves on the GOAD board, every application that's now coming through, she is asking about what their commitment is to buy from Nevada vendors. And Governor Sisolak has asked us to kind of up, uh, up the standard with companies that are interested to come here and, and prove to us and show to us that they're committed to being strong community players and have small business, have commitment to small business and, and a commitment to uh, a Nevada workforce. Second, though, is we have a unit in the state government that does procurement outreach for small business. It comes through us from the Defense Department. But one of the things I discovered when I took this job is that we were not using that unit to recruit them for state contracts. Uh, that's been changed now. And so the PTAC unit that's within GOAD is now also out there uh, trying to uh, land small business contracts uh, with state government agencies, and that work will continue. I don't know the answer about restrictions. There's always commerce clause provisions and that type of thing. Uh, but uh, I, I'll, I, I'll certainly take it under advisement and, and investigate a little further. Okay, excellent. We also have uh, on the line uh, Jaime Cruz with Workforce Connections. Um, he's been a great partner of both the LBGEA, the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance with Jonas and the Vegas Chamber and many, many others. Um, and we've been working very hard on, on developing a, a workforce development committee. And I know uh, Dr. Steven mentioned the workforce normal and beyond. Jaime, uh, are you there? Are you on the line with us? I am here, Mary Beth, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, go ahead. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think um, what uh, Shandell mentioned is really important that small businesses need to play, a, a, a will play a major role in, in the recovery of our economy. And so as you know, Mary Beth, we have been working together with the LVGA and the Vegas Chamber and the other chambers of commerce to really connect with those small businesses. Together, we implemented the layoff aversion pilot to help some of those businesses keep uh, over 300 staff members on the payroll during the worst times of the pandemic. But now we are set up to really be there to help them and connect them to the millions of dollars available in the public workforce development system through what we have just opened at the Vegas Chamber and at the Sahara West Library, which we call Employee MV Business Hubs. That brings together partners from the workforce development system to really streamline for these businesses what can sometimes be a very complex and bureaucratic system to, again, help them as, as simply as possible uh, to recover and grow again. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Jaime, and thank you for your partnership. We also have another question from Golda Cordowin. She says, are there going to be any incentives for entrepreneurs to open a small business in Las Vegas this year? I know Mike Kaczmarski addressed that. Jonas, in conjunction with that question, I would point this one to you. Are there new industry opportunities emerging for Southern Nevada as we recover, especially as it relates to Golda's question about incentives for entrepreneurs? Yeah, great question. Um, it, in fact, we're currently working with uh, Roland and the team at SRI on updating the, uh, the target industries that Southern Nevada focuses on for our recruitment efforts in particular. Um, we expect many of the, uh, the traditional high growth industries to, uh, to return, but we know that there's been a lot of shifts as well. So there's emerging opportunities. Good news is we're starting to um, you know, see that bounce back. In fact, um, our team is going to be presenting uh, around a th uh, companies uh, that represent around a thousand jobs we anticipate at the next um, uh, upcoming GoEd board meeting. So there's there's some positive movements. Um, what do those industry targets look like? Um, so more to come, but we know manufacturing, logistics, distribution um, is going to be a big part of that. Southern Nevada, but really statewide healthcare um, kind of at all levels, service delivery, R&D, 
Um, education needs to be a big part of, of our strategy. Sports-related industries, technology um, benefits everybody. So I think you'll see a big push continued there. Um, and business service industries as well. We've got a, a growing ecosystem around uh, all kinds of different business services. Many of these can be entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneur opportunities. In fact, you know, there are bad news coming out of the difficulties we've had. A lot of firms um, have reduced capacity or even don't exist anymore, but we've seen a spike in permitting um, and applications for new businesses. So I do think there is gonna be a lot of opportunities for those uh, startups and new firms to move into, uh, into those spaces um, look for more uh, updates on target industries in about two months. Okay, excellent. Uh, Rick Shaw asks if there is an EDON for Southern Nevada. And yes, Rick, that would be Mr. Jonas Peterson, who was just speaking. That would be the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. So happy to answer that question. Um, also, an, another question that comes up a lot, and, and we've sort of touched on this, but uh, I know Dr. Stephen did as well. Um, when we talk about uh, attracting new businesses, whether it's Southern Nevada, um, Northern Nevada, or to the rurals, what are some of the things that companies look for, both Mike and Jonas? I know we talk about things like education, um, homes, uh, healthcare, uh, and what kind of roadblocks are you getting that we might be able to, is an opportunity for us to, to work on to fix? Well, that's something we all could probably uh, uh, dive into uh, for a long time. I'll share some quick, uh, happy to uh, share some quick remarks from Mary Beth. Um, Nancy Bruin published a, a great op-ed piece in the Nevada Independent recently showing a lot of the state advantages for business development, but also recognizing and quantifying that we got some real challenges, especially around workforce quality um, uh, and education that um, I think we're aware of in, in Nevada. and are very um, real when it comes to attracting new companies. Workforce is um, almost always the first question we get from prospective companies. So uh, lots of work to do there. I'll, I'll also say, um, you know, supporting the tools of economic development. Incentives have been wildly successful. ROI, depending on how you measure it, nearly 100 to one, for every abated dollar, bring in $100 of impact back to the communities. We need to continue this investment and, uh, and then support and really invest in the, the economic development uh, system. Go ahead, RDAs, we got to maintain that funding. Now more than ever, job creation is critical. We need it, especially in Southern Nevada. Mary Beth, I would, I would reinforce Jonas's uh, push for workforce development. We're really talking about upskilling, taking a worker who is being displaced by technology, by the pandemic or by other um, changes and upskilling them so that they can fill some of the quality jobs we have coming to our community. So that workforce development piece is incredibly important. And the second part of that equation is just basic education. Our K through 12 is grossly underfunded. Uh, a lot of people will argue that until the cows come home, I'll tell you. Um, just spending time with our superintendent uh, yesterday, they don't know what to do with the cuts coming. They're talking about other issues going on. Um, they are in true panic mode right now. Of course, we're in session uh, K through uh, the elementary level are in classroom. So they're dealing with the pandemic on a daily basis. But that said, our education institutions have not been taken care of, have not been a priority in the state. And if we're going to really meet the needs of our economy going forward, the technology workforce, the advanced manufacturing workforce, we've got to invest in those kinds of skills because it's too expensive to move employees into the state just to do the jobs. So they're gonna go somewhere else. And speaking of advanced manufacturing and incentive, Jonas hit it on the head when he said, incentives are part of the process. Uh, most people don't realize uh, other than maybe Roland that uh, we're one of eight states that tax manufacturing equipment. And yet we have listed advanced manufacturing as one of our targets. Well, the way we've been so successful there as we've abated that tax down to 2% in order to make us competitive with the rest of the country. Well, a lot of people look at that abatement and say, look what you gave the company. You haven't given the company anything. You've just taken less tax away from them. And if you didn't do that, they would be going somewhere else. So it's unfortunately the incentives word has become a negative. It's very much 
an important part of our transition, economic transition, our continued success. And we really need to embrace that as part of our, our plan going forward. Mike, you make a great point about the manufacturing tax and, and you touched on in uh, education, especially K through 12. Sebra Newby asked a question about the importance of institutions of higher education um, in diversifying these regional economies. Does, would anyone like to uh, take that one? I'll, I'll just jump on that and say that higher education institutions are incredibly important. The skill sets we're looking for going forward and not just that, but the, the innovation that comes out of the universities, the talent that comes out of the universities. 10 years ago, 80% of our graduates would go out of state after they graduated. Our goal should be that they stay, 80% stay in state. We're, we're approaching that number now because of our growth, but I can tell you that talent needs to stay in the state. We're spending so much time and energy educating our, our youth. We wanna keep them here with great job opportunities. So it's a balance educate them and then give them the opportunity to invest, take that investment and, and put it back in our state. So our, our um, higher education institutions are far more than just a diploma. It's the skills aligned with the needs of the employers going forward. And we see that happening more and more. So it's a very, very important component of our success going forward. You know, um, if I could follow up, I give a shout out to the Haas Corporation that located its manufacturing facilities there in Henderson, but immediately built a public private partnership with uh, the community college and uh, the state was able to put resource dollars into that. Uh, we've also put resource dollars into uh, uh, mobility training in the rural areas where we actually take the training modules to the rurals. If you go to the GOAD website, we have stood up a skills evaluation system. We invested a half million dollars in CARES Act dollars in the software where literally you can put your resume and your job skills into this and it will match up and tell you kind of what career path you need to uh, be might want to be considered pursuing. It's very sophisticated software. And I guess what I've learned in my engagement with small business is either government needs to make uh, engagement with small business easier or we need to provide small business with more resources to help them engage with government. And that's what I'm committed to try to do. Excellent, thank you, Director Brown. Uh, did anybody else want to weigh in on that one before we go to the next question? No. Okay. Excellent. Uh, Jarrett Clark with uh, Congressman Horsford's office is on the line. And Jarrett says, beyond immediate relief efforts, what are some strategies or opportunities at the federal level that you would like to see for helping rebuild Nevada's economy? Great question, Jarrett. Um, I'll let me step in on that one. Um, for Southern Nevadans, it may be hard to understand this because when you drive around, there seems to be a lot of available land. Unfortunately, we do not have a lot of available land for industrial and commercial development. Um, the congressional delegation led by Senator Cortez Mastro in the Senate and, the, and, our, and our three, uh, four House members will be uh, working on a Southern Nevada lands bill. John Restrepo uh, has done a lot of work in this, but we're going to need more commercial industrial space uh, to put large uh, manufacturing style facilities. Uh, the second issue is uh, the, the infrastructure bill. Uh, Nevada needs to be ready when uh, President-elect Biden or President Biden pursues an infrastructure bill with a list of things it needs. And I have tasked Chris Sanchez at GOAD, who has assembled uh, a group of Southern Nevada leaders at the deputy level uh, to, to start to work on what that list would look like and what infrastructure enhancements we need. As Dr. St Roland Stevens pointed out, we need to tap every federal dollar that's available. The uh, state treasurer is, is, is working diligently right now to try to figure out how to tap more federal grant monies. And, uh, and, and so those three areas, infrastructure, Southern Nevada lands bill and uh, federal grants and anything we can do in those areas would, would help our long-term resiliency. And if I, could just pile, well said. Yeah, if I could just pile on, um, we have the Washington County lands bill. We are out of land. Um, our industrial park is full. We're really forcing people to go 30, 40 miles outside the metro area to acquire land when we have a lot of land in the lands bill that would put it much closer, help us grow as a, as a, a, a smart community as opposed to continuing to drive, you know, these many distances to find land. So our Washington County lands bill is incredibly important as far as our future growth. Um, Mary Beth, uh, I saw a question in there about water. If you don't mind, I'd just also like to say that uh, 
since becoming director, I have uh, set up monthly meetings with the head of conservation and natural resources and the office of energy. So the, when we're receiving applications and pursuing leads, uh, we are also measuring them against uh, any environmental externalities that might come from that. And that had never been done before the Sisolak administration. And so we're, we're doing that as part of the evaluation process early on, because I certainly, you know, I don't want to spend time chasing a company that, that where it doesn't fit our, our climate, uh, either north or south. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question from Alexandria. She says, most of the conversation around economic development has been centered on bringing businesses from out of state uh, to this region. She says, what in, uh, initiatives might be in place to foster local uh, locals building diverse businesses here. Um, she says specifically in Southern Nevada, and, and then she goes on to say that she feels like Northern Nevada has far more entrepreneurial groups and connections to the university. So um, Jonas, I think that might be a question for you if you wanna weigh in on that one. Yeah, happy to. Um, you know, I, I think the uh, entrepreneurial space is one where um, you know, many partners would like to do more uh, in, uh, in Southern Nevada. I do see it as a, as a huge opportunity. There's uh, a lot of resources you can, uh, you can check out um, that are available to businesses, especially through uh, pandemic recovery resources on businessinfonetwork.org. Um, we see entrepreneur and that startup space in particular um, as a huge opportunity where I know our team at LBJ would, uh, would uh, sure like to do more. I can also, Mary Beth, speak to that as GOAD when it was established, built into its DNA was the poaching. We were supposed to go outside the state bring something in. Um, I'm trying to get us a little more focused on how we grow internally uh, with the resources that we have. One of the things we're trying to do, at least in the rural parts, uh, is, is bring a lot of the mining supply chain to Nevada so it's not sitting outside of Nevada. Um, and we're just, we're also starting now a series of regular consultations with local government because they would know best where those opportunities rest. And so we're, we will be prioritizing that going forward. But the original conception of economic development was as a poaching operation, not as a, a redevelopment, but we'll, we'll change that. Well, excellent. Well, uh, with that, with respect to everybody's time, we are out of time, but I would like to uh, give any of you an opportunity to uh, make some closing remarks, uh, particularly Dr. Stephen, uh, as you haven't spoken quite as much, but anybody who has closing remarks or if there's something we haven't touched on, please feel free to, uh, to speak now. Thank you. Well, uh, first, let me say, listening to my, my friends here, uh, Nevada has great leadership in the economic development space. Uh, and uh, to be congratulated, of course, miles to go before you rest. Well, you'll never rest, but uh, a lot of work to be done. But uh, I think some of the key points have been hit on, right? Um, innov innovation, but innovation as a, as a function of people, the graduates of your higher education institutions, but also the people who are moving here. They, that is gold dust. You could have people moving here from the Bay Area who have accumulated uh, shares in, in businesses that they've been working in. They're now working remotely. Turns out it, the weather's rather nice in Northern Nevada. Turns out that the rock climbing is great in Southern Nevada, right? Maybe they, maybe they want to stay. What do they do? They start a business, which they know how to do, by the way. And they have all of the context and all of the experience to do that. So. For innovation, talent is the resource. To grow your existing incumbent businesses, it's talent, right? But they need, as Mike Kosminski and Jonas knows this perfectly well too, they need new skills. Tech, the rate of technological change, and I've alluded to this, is going to be extraordinary. And by the way, I mean, innovation will be part of it in the next 10 years. I truly and passionately believe this. I believe that the US economy will become largely electrified in the next decade. What on earth does that mean? That means that whole supply chains need to be reinvented. Do you have workers who can work in those new factories, right, in, in that new supply chain? So it's talent and then infrastructure. Do you have the connectivity 
Do you have the rail connections? Do you have the logistics parks? Do you have vehicle charging stations? Do you have the grid infrastructure? The list is, again, endless. Right? Do you have the freeways, by the way? If, you, if you've got congestion, looking at you, Spark Reno Sparks, right? You, you need to work on that as well, just bread and butter, right? So uh, talent and infrastructure, and you'll get the innovation, you'll get the technological change, you'll get the growth. Thank you. Excellent, Dr. Steven. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your remarks. We appreciate it very much. Jonas, Mike, or uh, Director Brown? Um, you know, let me say I'm a former Clevelander. Uh, my friends in the Midwest wish they had the opportunities that we have in yes. front of us today. Um, as we confront this pandemic, you know, we brought 14 or 15 new businesses to Nevada at the last GOAD meeting. We've got another stream of them coming. My friends in Ohio, Northern Ohio particularly, they don't have those opportunities knocking on their door. You know, you saw the map that Dr. Stevens put up. There are countries that would like to be positioned in the geographical position that Nevada occupies with respect to those Western and Pacific markets. So I think I would just say, you know, uh, these are tough times. We're going to get through them. Nevada's gotten through tougher times than uh, this, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think the good jobs today, better jobs tomorrow. Absolutely. Mary Beth, I, I, so I would jump in and, and highlight um, one more bright spot that I think we need to uh, stay focused on, and that's the collaboration we've seen um, among nonprofit organizations. So chambers, regional development authorities, working with government, and trade groups, industry groups, been phenomenal over the last year, a huge advantage. Um, we need to keep up that push, maybe even look at ways to formalize that collaboration. Um, big shout out to Betsy Fretwell for leading the business info network, pulling groups together. Um, this is a bright spot and something that we as, as a nonprofit um, uh, business alliances need to, need to keep pushing. I would agree, thank you. Uh, Betsy has done a great job and, and all the chambers across the entire state were involved in that and Mike Kazmersky was as well. So it was more of a statewide effort and collaboration this year, which I think was just tremendous. But I know Mike had uh, some points to weigh in with as well. Just Mary Beth, I wanted to thank you and your team. Um, certainly thinking statewide is so important. We have some success up here, but we're, we're not gonna succeed without the state succeeding. And that's really, you know, the South. Southern Nevada is what it's all about in this state. So we'll do whatever we can to help the South. At the end of the day, it's about education and investment. And so the more we can do that, I think the quicker we'll get out of this, this trouble we're in right now. Well, that's great. Thank you, uh, Mike Kazmersky at EDON, Jonas Peterson at LBGEA, Dr. Roland Steven, your, pro, your uh, presentation was outstanding. And of course, as always, uh, GOED Director uh, Michael Brown, we really appreciate your leadership. Thank you all so much for your time today. We've had several requests for that PowerPoint. We, we can send that out after this uh, webinar is over. So thank you all again for your service to the state. We wish you all a, a great rest of your week and everybody be safe. Thank you so much.